Uh, Julie, if you can please uh, take it away. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's a busy time. It's a crazy time. Um, and it's particularly challenging this year, um, more so than even other years. And so I appreciate your uh, time and attention um, and your dedication to making sure that your students transition to college uh, is, is a positive one. I just want to start by giving folks a little bit of general information about who we are and what we do and how we do it and why we do it. Um, I don't know if any of those of you that are here are familiar with Hofstra's history um, regarding serving the needs of students with a variety of different kinds of challenges and disabilities. Um, but I am very proud of the fact that Hofstra was the first private university in the entire country to become totally wheelchair accessible. Um, that's really remarkable. Uh, and the first two colleges uh, that became wheelchair accessible were public universities. And of course, the first one was Berkeley because they're always first. <laughs> and the second one was the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So we were the first private university to in the late 1960s have uh, students who were blind and deaf and students who were wheelchair users living on our campus and attending higher education, which at that time um, was almost unheard of. Uh, and so that actually was one of the things that originally drew me to Hofstra. Um, I'm the only part of me that you can see is from the neck up in, in this environment, but um, I got into this line of work um, for lots of reasons, but one of them is that I was born in 1962 with spina bifida and I am a wheelchair user. Uh, and so doing this work for my students is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's not a job for me. It's a, it's a vocation. Uh, and it's something that I do um, because I like to be able to talk to students um, about their experiences and, and provide them with wisdom I have from my experiences. And what I always tell students in the beginning is um, the way I teach students how to be successful in college uh, is to do exactly the opposite of what I did. Um, I didn't have support services there uh, when I started college and I was floundering and I didn't know, you know, I practically flunked out of college my first year. So I always start off with my students and tell them, don't worry. I am what my mother and father referred to as a late bloomer. And uh, that's okay, right? Uh, some of us, it takes a little bit longer and some of your students might be with me a little bit more than four years and that's okay too, right? Um, but that is sort of the, the, the college's history we also, in terms of serving the needs of students with non-apparent disabilities like um, learning disabilities, attention deficit disorders, mm -hmm. and things like that, we were one of the first colleges in the country to have comprehensive support programs um, for those students. We have now the PALS program and the academic coaching program, and the PALS program has been around since 1979, um, which is a, a support program where I employ three learning specialists. I have um, eight, there are eight staff members in my office and I have three professional learning specialists and they work with students who have learning differences and learning challenges of various types to help them develop more effective learning strategies, time management, organizational skills, and all of those kind of soft skills that you need to be successful in college that sometimes you don't actually get taught, right? Um, a lot of students come to us and they were taught science and social studies and literature and math, but no one ever taught them how to study. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we specialize in. So we are, as I said, a large office at Hofstra. We are currently serving 850 students at Hofstra in some capacity. And believe it or not, we know them all. 
there's somebody in my office, uh, there's someone, if it's not me, there's someone in my office who knows any student that's registered with our office, um, especially their faces. I'm terrible with names, but when I see a face going over the Unispan, I'm like, that student's registered with our office. Um, but we serve 850 students, and some of them we just serve in very cursory ways, right? We, they come in, they disclose a disability at the beginning of their career at Hofstra, they give us documentation, they ask for our accommodations, we provide the accommodations, and every semester they ask us to, to provide letters to give their professors, and that's it, right? Sometimes we might have a student who has a physical challenge, who comes to Hofstra and says, I have a, you know, I have a mobility challenge and I need an accessible room and bathroom in the residence hall. We set that up. We may not interact very much with that student after that because now they have what they need, right? But we also have a lot of students for whom our office is home base, right? Our office is the place that they can come, not just if they have a question about accommodations, but if they're having a bad day. Um, if they're upset about something that happened in the class, if they got a bad grade and they're upset about that and don't know what to do about it, if they're not getting along with their roommate, if they can't find anything decent to eat in the cafeteria, if they're getting strange emails from financial aid and don't know what to do, we are the destination office. So the first thing that I want you guys to make sure that you tell all of your students is if they have not made themselves known to our office yet, encourage them to do so. And here's how you can tell them how easy we are to find. Go to the student center. Go into the dining hall, get something to eat. Come out of the dining hall, go to the bookstore, buy a pen, and then turn the corner and you'll be in student access services. We are in the hallway right behind the bookstore. Um, and we want students to see us. We are in this environment this semester going to be offering both in-person and virtual meetings with students. And so one of the things that we can do if students prefer to meet virtually like this is um, we can help them learn how to just go into their portal and make uh, an appointment with us anytime they want to see someone in my office. Um, we provide a wide range of services. We have a full complement of assistive technologies that students use um, to facilitate, uh, you know, completing their coursework. We have dictation software and note-taking software and audio and electronic books and all of those kinds of technologies uh, that students use to circumvent whatever challenges they may have uh, in the classroom. We have so many students that are registered with our office that when students have accommodations in testing, so changes in the way that they take examinations for their classes like extra time or a separate room or whatever other accommodations they have for testing, we have so many students that instead of just telling professors that they have to provide these accommodations, we have a testing center and I have a professional staff member who runs the testing center uh, and we take care of that for the student as a courtesy uh, for uh, the courtesy of the, the student and the faculty member. So if a student wants to use our testing center to get their testing accommodations and take their exams with us, we have that, you know, we provide that service to students, you know, whenever they want it, whenever they need it. And we have some students that take every single quiz and every single exam in our testing center with their accommodations. And we have other students that say, you know, I don't really want to do that, but you know what? Final exams, I'm taking all my finals with SAS. And we leave it up to the students to determine how and when they want to utilize whatever services they are eligible for. Um, eligibility is the next thing that I want to touch on very briefly. Um, there's a lot of question often around this because being having been eligible for and being served in special education in the K-12 system and being eligible for services in college are two totally different things. So I have a lot of parents who say to me, so my student has a learning disability and they were diagnosed when they were in the third grade and they were in special education until eighth grade, but then they got, quote, exited out of the program and no longer have a IEP or whatever. Um, it, in that case, it doesn't matter. 
that student still has that condition. And so they're, they are still eligible to apply to our office for services if, um, if they desire to. Uh, and so don't necessarily equate being served in special education with being eligible for services because we are governed not by education law at Hofstra and in higher education in general. We are not governed by education law. We are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, which basically says that anybody that has any condition that um, negatively impacts any um, central life activity from um, walking and hearing and seeing and talking and reading and writing and eating and sleeping, whatever that, daily activity is that is impacted by the disability, it may be something for which they may require an accommodation in the college setting. And so we definitely want to encourage students um, to go ahead and register with us ahead of time, um, rather than waiting until there's an urgency and a problem and then there's a crisis and then everybody's scrambling, trying to figure out how to uh, get the student what they need um, in order to solve the problem. We would prefer that students register with our office in advance. And then if they don't need us, they don't need us. And they don't need to use their accommodations. But if they ever do, they can. And it's not like, oh my God, it's first of December and exams are coming and I need extra time for my exams. I'm panicking. What do I do? We don't want that. We want students to, to to let us know about who they are and what they need, what they may need. And then later, if we have to do something for them, we're prepared to do that. So that's kind of our, you know, our, our, our modus operandi. It's, it's our way of doing business. We want to be um, overly um, liberal with students in terms of getting everybody to register with our office rather than waiting until there's a problem. Um, so we're, in a way, we're sort of the opposite of the way special education is run in the K-12 system. Sort of one of the, one of the rules of the K-12 system is, well, you, you, in order to, to be referred to be eligible for services, you kind of have to be doing poorly in school, right? So they wait until something is wrong and then say, okay, now we, what are we going to do? We don't want to, we don't want to do that. Um, so encourage your students to communicate with us and connect with us and get everything taken care of to be eligible for services before a problem arises. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to sort of touch on is um, this for many students is the first time they've had to self-advocate because they've had you guys beating the drum, right? Uh, and I, I understand where that comes from. And I understand what that's about. Uh, when I was a little girl in Connecticut um, and the school system didn't have services for me and told my parents that I was not gonna go to school, that I was not eligible for school and that I was quote, retarded. Um, my mother became known in our little town in Connecticut as the lunatic on the hill because she always had something to say about, you know, she was like, when the super, when, I'll just tell you guys this little story and then we'll move on with whatever questions you have. Um, when the school system in our town in Connecticut told my parents that I was not eligible for school, kids like me didn't go to school. And the superintendent told my mother that I was retarded and couldn't learn. My mother went down to the superintendent's office, banged on the door, and in those days, in those old days, they had those uh, if you had a bank account, a, a savings account at a bank, they had those little leather passbooks with the ledger in it, right? And they would imprint every time you made a deposit. My mother went to the superintendent's office and slammed that little passbook on his desk and said, my name is Carol Yendra and my daughter's name is Julie Yendra and I have $2,000 to my name and I will bet you $2,000 that my daughter's IQ is higher than yours. <laughs> so, um, Rest assured, when you drop your kids off and leave them in our hands, they're in good hands. They are in good hands, but they have to engage in what I call help-seeking behavior. They have to be honest. They have to ask for help. They have to admit when they're tanking. 
because that's when we can make sure that they're getting the support and the services and the assistance that they require. Um, I don't, I don't play, right? I don't play in my office with, oh, I don't know if I want to, I, <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that because I don't want to be, look, everybody's different. Everybody has challenges. Everybody has needs. Everybody has talents and everybody's good at some things and not so good at others, right? I'm good at some things. I'm not particularly good at walking. Okay. I can deal with that, right? Because there's ways for me to fix that. Um, but it's going to be very challenging for a lot of your students, I would imagine, to be in a position of having to advocate for themselves, but tell them that we are here to help them learn how to do that. Okay, so that's my song and dance. So now I would like to have Bronca um, open up the forum for any questions or things that you would specifically like for me to address. I just did. The chat feature is open, but you're very welcome to unmute yourself, put the video on, and ask a question. Um, hi, this is Craig Saltzman. I'll, I'm fine asking. Um, uh, Julie, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited and uh, uh, really um, hope that my daughter uh, takes the initiative. Uh, she's always self-advocated for herself. Um, and looking at universities, this was the main, this was our main focus uh, to come to Hofstra. Um, my question would be uh, just the introduction. So she had an informal meeting and went through a, uh, an acceptance process uh, with the student academic service department. Um, so she was, uh, they brought on, we, we dropped her off at campus on Monday and her roommates are moving in today. When does she come over, when should she come over to meet um, uh, this, somebody in student academic services and is she assigned a um, a coach or a mentor in academic services? How does that work? Did she get admitted to the PALS program? She did get admitted to the PALS program. Yes. She needs to check her email because her learning specialist is communicating with her. Okay. Okay. So she's and you yeah. can tell her tomorrow, if nothing else, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, if she looks on her welcome week schedule of events, Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there's a Zoom meeting for students in the PALS program. Tell her to attend tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Okay, tomorrow at 11 o'clock. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Who else has a question? I do. Hi, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, Karen, you can do it. I was just wondering if they're in the PALS program and they're struggling with something, at what point does the counselor contact the parents since the kids are 18? Um, are they allowed to or do they email or call only if it's something serious or how does that work? Awesome question. And one that I get asked all the time. So here is, here is how this goes. If, if, if we feel that your child is in danger, we're gonna call you, okay? Um, if your student is maybe not going to some classes and not doing all their work, we may not reach out to you, but you can call us and say, Julie, it's Karen, I'm worried about my kid, I haven't heard anything, I suspect things are not going well academically, and what I will do is I will investigate, I will figure out what's going on, and then I will call your student into my office and say, let's talk about how things are going, and let's be real, okay, let's talk about what's, what's happening. And then I'm gonna say, so your mom called, and she wants to kind of get filled in on what's going on, so what do we need to talk to your mom about? And we'll have that conversation and then, and then we're gonna call you. My motto with regard to this is I want parents involved. I want parent feedback. I want your influence on your student to be part of all of this because you guys are paying the bill, right? You can yank some chains that we can't yank, frankly. Um, but my motto comes from uh, an old motto from the disability rights movement, which is nothing about us without us. 
right? So I'm not going to have private conversations with you behind your students back. I don't believe in that. But I'm more than well, I, I'm more than welcome your phone calls and your inquiries and your involvement, and we will definitely call you back. But you, you I want you to know that it's likely that your student's going to be in the room when I call you back. Okay. Uh, Julie, may I add something? So a good tip is don't email Julie or her staff, but email your student and copy Julie or PALS advisor. So you direct, you are giving ownership of the uh, academic journey to your student, but still give information to the PALS advisor or academic coach uh, what the issues are. And the other thing is that if there is a significant, um, if there's significant feedback from faculty to the Center for Academic Excellence or the advising office through that alert system and that mid-semester advisory system, if it looks broadly like there's significant, you know, issues happening academically, um, at that point, we will speak to the student and we will highly suggest to the student that we call mom and dad and say, because we don't want Thanksgiving to be the time when you find out that things have not gone well. Um, so if we, if we get, if, if the faculty are giving us feedback that is alarming to us, we're going to talk to your student about it and we're going to encourage your student to communicate with you about it and with us to help if that's needed. Uh, as we wait and uh, other parents to, for, for questions, I would like to mention that we have a, a special group of parents of, uh, of students who are registered with Student Access Services. SAS Parent Support Network, and we invite your involvement. We always have uh, at least one workshop uh, a semester uh, for, for you, parents only. And this is usually where parents exchange um, advice and we bring a guest speaker uh, and answer your questions. So uh, please uh, keep an eye on those emails and upcoming uh, date for that fall workshop. Julie, you'll have to give me a date so I can, I can, I can. I will do that. And I always attend those meetings too. Yeah, absolutely. I think Mary has a question. Mary, go ahead. Mary Pat Sargent, hi. Thank you very much for all that you've done to help. My son has been contacted by the Student Access Services and he's setting up a meeting with your staff. The question that he isn't sure of is when to let his professors know. Somebody going to guide him and yes. Help yes, him here's what's going to happen. He's going to have that meeting and he's going to learn all about his accommodations and how to implement them in the classrooms. And then we are going to email accommodation letters to all of his professors with his permission. And his professors will all be notified by our office. And then we're going to say to him, now that we've emailed your professors and they have this information from us, we encourage you to reach out to your professors to say, hey, I know that you got my accommodation letter from SAS. Is there a time that we could chat a little bit about how my accommodations are going to work in your classroom? Because of course, every class is a little bit different, right? And so we want that to be the entryway for students and faculty to have a conversation about how it's going to work in their class. And he falls into that category of he needed a lot of services when he was a little guy and as he got older, it dropped off, but we were highly recommended to get back into it for college. So we're back to not Good. knowing really what he needs. Until Good. He and just tell him work. that, you know, to go to that meeting, to communicate with his professors, and to communicate with us when and if he ever has a problem. Absolutely. We're going to assume if your students do not reach out to us for asking for help, we're going to assume everything is going well. Right. Yeah, no, I've told him that. And, yeah. um, but it's hard for him. He's got to get into it first and know 
where the needs will be. And it's yeah, kind of and that's understandable. And you know, when he attends that meeting, he'll know where we are. He'll know that we don't bite. Mm -hmm. you know? And he'll know where to go if he ever, you know, when he figures out, oh, this is harder than I thought it was going to be, because that's what usually happens. Oh, this yeah. is harder than I thought it was going to be. Then he knows where to go to come get help. Absolutely. All right. Very good. Thank you. I think Stephanie had a question. Yes, ma'am. So I, we had met with you probably a month and a half ago during the summer and had our initial setup with you. When is when are y'all having, or is it the student's responsibility to reach out to y'all, or y'all reaching out to the students to set up that actual discussion of the accommodation? We are reaching. Already been. We are reaching out to students. So have your student monitor their email because if we have all the paperwork and we've reviewed the file, I would bet you ten dollars that my uh, accommodations manager Stephanie has already been emailing. And you, she may have and just not said a word to me because she's great at advocating. So. Yeah. for herself it so. may have all may already be happening okay anybody else have a question hi i have a question hi so we're actually in the car from dropping off our freshmen um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is all a little fresh um but we have a question related to his accommodation so um our son has a chronic episodic medical condition which sometimes he's fine, other times he may wind up in the hospital and it's totally unpredictable. Um, so we had a, con a conversation with your accommodations um, manager earlier this week. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, we walked through some of the accommodations and it sounded to me like a lot of the accommodations are really discretionary on the part of the professor. And, and that is a big, that does seem like a big shift from you know, what we saw at, at the high school level, particularly if he's in the hospital. So can you share a little bit more about that? Because I'm sure. worried that he'll be in the hospital. Most, yeah, okay. most accommodations are very straightforward and very absolute. And if the student gets extra time on their test, they get extra time. The one that you're, and I know the one you're talking about because you just described your son. There's an accommodation that is designed to assist students just like your son who have what we call chronic episodic illnesses. And like exactly right. like you just said, Monday, I'm fine. Tuesday, I'm fine. Wednesday, I can't get out of bed, right? And how do you then explain that to a professor who said, well, you were fine yesterday, right? So what we do with that is called possible attendance modification. And what it is, is a right. set of guidelines that ask questions about why do you require attendance? How, does it, how could a student other than attending class demonstrate competency with the coursework. But the, but the whole reason for doing that is that we want the student and the faculty member to have a conversation in the beginning so that when the student is sick and he can't go to class, there's not a panic because okay. he's already made a plan with the professor about how it's going to be handled if he can't go to class. And that's the reason we do that right, is that we want, the, we want the conversation between the student and the faculty member. The faculty member might say, hey, listen, attendance in this class is really important for the following reasons. We have these class discussions, blah, blah, blah. And then the student can say, well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. If I have to be out for a period of time, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z additional assignments for you when I'm feeling better. I'm going to write some extra summaries of the reading material and send it to you via email so that you know that I'm keeping up with the material. Right. So it just really settles it. What we want to avoid is a kid who's gone for two weeks. Right. And then he comes right. back to the faculty member and says, I'm sorry, I was very sick. I had to go to the hospital. I missed two weeks of class. What do I need to do to make it up? Now the professor's like, I don't really know, right? But right. this way, the professor knows this student may be out. And so I need to be of the mindset to be prepared to provide whatever I need to to him for him to be able to keep up. Great. That's so so the ability to make up exams and that sort of thing isn't as discretionary. Because honestly, that's the part that right. concerned me. I was like, what? They can decide just to not let him make things up? Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing about the chronic episodic illness issue is that we always encourage students to um, utilize the testing accommodations in the testing center. And here's why. 
right? If he has an exam in a history class on Tuesday morning, and Tuesday morning he wakes up and it ain't happening, right? He's one of those I can't get out of bed days. Right. He emails the professor and contacts us. We've already got permission from the professor to administer the exam. We've already got a copy of the exam. We can just reschedule it. Perfect. Okay, I don't think he added the testing accommodation because he was just thinking it means more time to take it, but he wasn't thinking about it in those terms. So I can I certainly have come back to us and say, I want to use the testing center. Perfect. Very good. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank Safe you. travels. Thank Julie, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julie, uh, I will read a question in, in, from Chad. How do I get accommodations set up for my childhood some in high school through an IEP? Whom do I contact? What info do I need to provide? Is there someone my child should contact if she finds, if she needs help? Yes. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay, so I'm gonna type into the chat. SAS at Hofstra.edu. Email our office. You can send us copies of whatever documentation you have. We're gonna send back to you uh, an application for the student to fill out, or you can just say to the student, go to SAS in the student center, they're going to give you an application to fill out, and then you can send us the documentation, and the student can fill out the application. We can also email it, we can send it electronically to the student, but that begins the process. Um, there's the application and the collection of the documentation. So if that hasn't happened already, let's make that happen now. Julie, is PILE's program still accepting students for this semester? I, I remember you telling me that you have quite a few applications and what is the process? We have a waiting list for the PILE's program this semester. However, we may have a space in the academic coaching program. The, only, the difference between PILE's and academic coaching is PILE's is forever and academic coaching is something you can pay for in the short term. It's a fee-based program that you pay for additional services for the semester. So you can meet with that learning specialist once a week. You can get that extra training and time management organizational skills. So email us at that sas at hopster.edu email address and, and get your student to come and talk with us. And we can talk to them about signing up for the academic coaching program. Also, once a student is accepted for accommodations, do they need to renew every year or uh, how does that work? I'll tell you in a second, I'm going to answer this question. Student access services. Okay. Um, they do not have to reapply for services every year. They do not have to supply new documentation every year. Once they are registered and approved for accommodations, it lasts for as long as they're at Hofstra. But what they do need to do every single semester because they have new faculty and are taking different classes is notify us that they want us to send out those accommodation letters to their new professors. So they do need to make contact with us at least once every semester. Julie, are there uh, any uh, li lists online of accommodations that are available or they, they you are evaluating each student uh, individually? Yeah. People say, what accommodations do you provide? And my answer is always whatever the student needs. Um, typical accommodations are, like I said, assistive technologies, note-taking software, um, screen reading software, audio books, um, the testing center, uh, all those kinds of things are typical. Um, but really we want to, we want to look at each individual student's file and figure out what the issue is and what the best way to solve it is. And so I don't like to pigeonhole accommodations because every student that comes to us with something new, we're like, oh, we didn't think of that before. Let's add this accommodation. Um, I mean, one of the accommodations that some students ask for is, uh, which is not typical, but, you know, certainly available, um, is what if they're terrified of doing presentations in front of groups of people in class? We can find some way to accommodate that. Right? That's not something that hundreds of students use, but it, you know, so we want to talk to each student about what, it, what do they think they're going to have problems with. Uh, Julie, how can parents find out if 
the student is indeed accepted to the PALS program. Do you send confirmation email or the kid can call you? Say that again? What was the question again, Baraka? So uh, a parent is not sure whether or not her student is uh, in PALS compared to academic coaching. Or is that. registered with our office? It's registered. He's registered with your office. Uh -huh. Is he in the PALS program? How, I mean, do you... Oh, tell, the, tell the parent to just call our office and Jackie, my secretary, will look that up and tell them. And I will put the email, uh, I mean... And the, the phone number. Phone number in the chat. Yep. Uh, how does a student make uh, take advantage of accommodations? So, for example, if 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 they, the services were approved, what is the next step for the student? So, the student, like I said, after we email the professor the accommodation list, the student will then initiate a conversation with the faculty member to discuss the accommodations and how they apply to that particular course. And they just need to say to the professor, like you know if they get extra time on tests, but they're enrolled in a distance learning course that's totally online and all the professor's exams are take home exams that are essay exams, extra time on test doesn't really apply, right? Um, but that's why we want the students after we send those accommodation letters to faculty to talk with faculty. And then in terms of like the testing, when they have that meeting with us, we're gonna, share with them how to let us know in advance if they have an upcoming exam so we can prepare for it. There's a form they fill out and get the professor to sign and it, it can be all done online, but we will share that with the student. They just notify us, like I have a chemistry exam next Tuesday at 10 o'clock and then we take care of it. Uh, Julie, we have a question about parking in the People First parking spot and if that spot is not accessible, where, whom do safety. students call? Public safety, definitely. And sometimes students notify us, hey, there's an auto door in the back of the student center that's not working and we'll call public safety for them. So if they call us or notify us, we're gonna see to it. But um, the first folks that always need to be notified if there's an issue like that is public safety. I just placed the public safety number, business number there, uh, if, if, you know, in the chat uh, feature so you can see it. By the way, our students learn to input the public safety number into their cell phones, uh, usually during orientation, and they have, they have it handy. Uh, I, I, did I miss any of the questions? I invite you being unmuted and please ask on the air but I think I covered... Uh... Oh, about the appointments. There's questions about making appointments. Uh -huh. Every student is gonna be trained in how to use the student management system that we use called the Connect system. When they log into their portal, they're gonna, they're gonna we're, everybody's gonna explain to them, their advisor, our office, every office is gonna be reinforcing this but they go into their portal and there's this thing called connect. When they click on connect, there's a whole list of student affairs offices that students can, can click on to make an appointment either virtually or by phone or in person with any of those offices. So if your student hasn't talked to you about the connect system yet, ask them about it. Hey, I heard about this system called connect. What do you know about it? Um, everybody can tell them, can show them. If, if your student does not, just tell them to come to our office, we'll show them how to do it. They can do it on their phone. If a student is completing courses remotely, what academic supports will be available and can they access them virtually? Yes. All services that are available in person are also available virtually including all of the tutoring, the writing center, the math learning lab, the content area tutoring for um, entry level courses, the science group tutoring for chemistry and physics and bio. If it was available in person on our campus, it's now available virtually. That's great, Julie, it's Mary. So where, where would they access that? Is, the, is it on their Blackboard page? 
Like how yes. do they go? information about tutoring on Blackboard. There will also often be information about tutoring that's content specific on the syllabus that their faculty, like they might say if they're taking like a biology course, often the faculty in biology will put at the bottom, if you need bio tutoring, here's how you get it. But okay. a lot of the content area tutoring is run through um, Diane Herbert's area, the Center for Academic Excellence. It's on the third floor of the library. So all they have to do is if, if nothing else, they come to our office or go to the third floor of the library to the Center for Academic Excellence and someone can help them get connected to a tutor for whatever, if it's a, a, a skill area or a specific course content. Okay, and Julie, if they wanted to do something virtually, they could just contact that office. Yep, just yep. they can them. just okay. call and speak to them and they'll walk them through it on the phone. Okay. Actually, here's how you click in, click this, click that to get a history, you know, a, hist a tutor for your history class. They'll show them how to do it. Thank you. Uh, Julie, are you in the office today? I, I know that we have uh, Friday oh. hours still. So it's a 4 p.m. Um, I think no, next I'm in the office. Are you in the office? Yeah. Can, can students come and see you today or should they make an appointment? I'm glad you asked that question. Because we have a lot of students that are checking in today and starting classes on Monday and people were like, oh my God, <laughs> my office is open Saturday and Sunday. Tell your students over the weekend, if they have some free time, they can come to Student Access Services in the Student Center nine to five, Saturday or Sunday, we're here. I would like to answer the question about if you received an email from me yesterday urging you to, to um, register for this forum, doesn't mean that your, your student is uh, uh, registered with Student Access Services, but you're welcome to, uh, your student is welcome to apply and, and, and get the accommodations if that's what you need. Uh, Julie, can you mention the difference about we guarantee access, not success, and the difference between high school and, and college. Well, people always raise their eyebrows when I say this, but I am a firm believer in the fact that people with disabilities are entitled to everything that their non-disabled peers are entitled to, including the right to choose to fail. The right not to go to class, the right not to study, the right to choose to fail. Um, we, we don't want that. Uh, we don't want students to fail, um, but we want our students to learn to be autonomous and to be in charge of their own destiny. And sometimes that means screwing up. Sometimes that means making a mistake, right? I told you at the beginning of this session that I nearly flunked out of college my first year. And I was in college in North Carolina and I was from this little town in Connecticut. And I went to see my first year advisor. It was like no, end of November, exams were in a couple weeks, finals, and I did not wanna have to go back to Connecticut and tell my parents that I flunked out of college. So I went to see my advisor and I said, Carter, Carter, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I'm behind, I haven't been going to my classes, I'm behind in all this work, what am I gonna do? And Carter said, how long will it take you to pack? And I was like, oh crap, she's not even gonna let me stay till the end of the semester, she's gonna send me home. And I said, oh my God, she said, no, 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 how long will it take you to pack a suitcase? And I said, an hour, she said, meet me in my office in an hour. And I packed a suitcase and I went to her office. And in the meantime, she had called her husband and said, guy, get the guest room ready. And she took me home with her and I lived in her guest room and she brought me in there and she said, there's a bed and a desk and a lamp and a clock. I will call you down for meals. And I stayed at her house for two weeks and passed all my exams. But I had to make a lot of mistakes. Yeah? My parents, one of the best things my parents ever did for me as a child with a disability is let me screw up. They let me bounce checks and fail courses and lose jobs and get in trouble with the popo. <laughs> um, 
these were all important things for me to learn how to do because I learned how to not do them again, right? Um, I learned that nothing is gonna get me down. I learned that I, I can survive anything. Um, and so I'm thankful that my parents let me mess up. So once in a while, I might tell you, if you're calling me, oh my God, my son's gonna flunk this course. I might once in a while say to you, you know, maybe that's not such a bad idea. Julie, there is a question about a PAL students. Um, do they have to sign in with you or with their PALS uh, advisor? Well, they're going to get, they're, they're already getting emails from our office. They, they, they uh, have probably gotten an email from their learning specialist saying, um, or a notification from their learning specialist saying, your weekly appointment with me is going to be Tuesdays at 10 o'clock. And if that hasn't happened already, it's going to be happening this weekend. We want to make sure that all students had schedules that were firm. We look at the student schedule. We select the time in between classes that looks like a good time to meet. If your student is in PALS and they're telling you that they don't know anything, tell them to look at their email. Hey, Julie, I just actually was texting with my daughter and she said she had not, she's not in PALS, but just in SAS. And so she has not received anything yet. She just went through her email. Daughter's name. Margaret Welch. Margaret Welch. I'm writing that down. I'm going to check it out. We'll have someone reach right. out to her. Thank you. Uh, Julie, do, yep. does the residence hall staff, uh, are they notified if no. students are in PALS program? No. No. We, no. There's no reason. The only disclosure that we provide to residents life, and it's for security and safety reasons, is any student that's living in the residence hall that has a sensory or mobility challenge that might make it difficult for them to exit the building in an emergency, all of the residence hall staff are provided with a list of students that might need assistance in an emergency. That's it. It's Beyond that, it's nobody's business. Uh, sometimes SAS parents uh, don't know whether or not to call. Please uh, uh, call me first because I really work very closely with, with Julie and uh, her advisors. And I might be able to answer some of your questions and just let Julie and her staff work with the students. They're usually booked solid in their, uh, in their appointments. So I welcome your calls and emails, but any SAS issues. And yes, the question about should my son come and see you guys this weekend, the answer is yes. Julie, what are your hours for Saturday and Sunday? Nine to five. Nine to five. And the, uh, you know, just tell them 107 Student Center right behind the bookstore. Very easy to, to remember. Um, what I, you know, I have a years long experience with uh, working with SAS parents and what the, the, uh, what's, what's happening almost every year is uh, students do not take advantage of what they have, what resources SAS is providing. So. Uh, if you have a feeling that your student is not telling you the truth and they are they're not going to those appointments with the palace advisor or not getting the letters or uh, you know any kind of questions you might have give me a call and let's strategize because uh, as as Julie mentioned uh, help seeking behavior this is the biggest lesson you can teach your SAS student and I'm telling as a, you as a parent of of a learning disabled child, it, it, it self advocacy and owning the journey. This is what we are trying to to, to help them understand. And I completely get it. Um, my daughter also did not want to help. I can do it by myself. I you know I, I know I can do it. I'm certain I can do it. I'm certain I can do it. And then then she fails three classes in a row. So it's it's very common. So getting your student on a consistent basis to keep those SAS appointments, PALS appointments, academic coaching appointments, 
please. Uh, you can also about the PALS program and the PALS program is something that typically you apply for when you apply to the university and it's a it's a comprehensive four year pro, four year commitment. But and if you didn't do that, don't worry if your student needs to work one on one with someone um, for a period of time, whether it's a semester or two semesters, academic coaching is there and you can implement, you know, participation in that program anytime you want. Julie, it, it, this is Craig Saltzman. Is there a possibility I could ask you who my daughter's learning specialist is? So when I call her and she looks at her emails, like I could have the dialogue to say, please yeah. reach out. Sure, absolutely. I don't know off the top of my head, I need to look, but I put my email address in the uh, chat. If you email me and ask me, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll email you back. Thank you very much. I invite Julie the the gamma Jewel to answer to ask the question on the air because I don't understand the question. Please. Just Hi. How are you? How are you? Good. Ask your question. <laughs> do we just specifically work with the learning specialist, or do we see, or does Michael see you at any point in time, or? How does that work? If Michael's in the PALS program, he's gonna he's gonna meet regularly with his learning specialist, not me. Not you. But okay. I'm available to consult with anytime there's any problem. Because you okay. know, sometimes I mean all my learning specialists are great, but everybody's got a different personality. And sometimes one member of my staff is a better fit for a particular student. And so we do some swapping around that's not an issue. Okay. You know? Okay. Thank you. Uh, where can parents find the fees for the academic coaching program? On our webpage, and I think you put, Branca, our website. Um, there are hyperlinks to PALS and academic coaching on our Student Access Services webpage that you can click on, and the brochures will come up and all the details about those programs are uh, on those links. Academic coaching is twenty-seven fifty per semester. That was an easy question. So yeah, it's not cheap to answer the other question. But I'll tell you something else. Students enrolled in the PALS and academic coaching programs, we have a 90 to 95% success rate in terms of our students who participate in those programs have a 90 on average every semester, a 90% um, um, chance that they're going to be in good academic standing at the end of the semester. If they come to their meetings and do what we tell them. Right. Every once in a while, there's a student who comes into my office every week, faithfully and religiously. And I say, how are things going? And he says, fabulous. I love it here. I'm doing great. I'm getting straight A's. And I find out that nothing he said to me was true. <laughs> what are you going to do? Right. But most of our, we have a very, very high success rate with our students. Uh, just imagine, I think that uh, students are also very eager to please you, parents, right? So they, they don't want to disappoint you. So sometimes they will not tell you the truth. That My daughter did not tell me the truth. So um, let's strategize on how to uh, get them regularly to their learning specialists and, and to Julie's staff. Are there tutoring places to go for all students there on campus and open for all? Yeah. yeah, the tutoring that I've been talking about, the writing center, the math learning lab, the content area tutoring center for academic excellence, that's not for students who are registered with our office, it's for everybody.
Guess what? It's almost five o'clock. You guys have been a fabulous group. I appreciate it. And I'm, and I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier in the hour. Don't worry about your students. They're in good hands. And Thank if you. We, and if we haven't answered your questions today, we, we just, um, I just put in the um, tutorial program from CAE in the uh, link in the chat. But if you have any such questions, they pop up right after we, we close this meeting, uh, please just send me email, parents at hofstra.edu. I admit I have a, a bunch of emails to get to today, but I will get to your email uh, as soon as I can. So thank you for being here. You are here for your students. We know that when you're involved, our students are successful. So keep an eye on our emails. I'll be uh, telling you about our SAS Parent Network uh, workshop with Julie and a probably guest speaker. And um, be involved every semester. Don't quit. Our students need you. Thank you, dear parents and family members. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.